So you've been working on Wonder Woman since last year. So what is it about the character that made you steer yeah. towards her? Um, you know, it was one of those things that I don't think I would have uh, ever had the guts to go up and say to DC, yes, please let me write Wonder Woman. But it was kind of fate <laughs> <laughs> that I had, I had just come off of, of Ms. Marvel when um, Chris Conroy, who was the editor at the time, gave me a call and said, hey, are you free to write Wonder Woman? And, you know, that's, that's kind of one of those phone calls that you remember yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. For, for the rest of your life. So, you know, I, I really had to go back and think about, okay, what is, what is the core of Wonder Woman's personality? What is it that makes her so compelling to so many generations of readers? And what can I do to continue that story in such a way that it's rewarding to people who've loved her their whole lives, but also has some interest to people who maybe had never read something about this character before? So it was it was a real challenge, and uh, I, I I think I I never really had to think about a long form story about a legacy character that is this old and had this much cultural significance. So uh, yeah, I was quite nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I was quite nervous by it. Well, that kind of leads on to my next question: was that we're asking, was it daunting to take on such an iconic character? You know, it it was really difficult because I had to kind of decide on the fly what parts of that 75-year history I wanted to bring into this story. I think it's tempting when you get a character like this who has so much backstory and, uh, you know, so much interesting and complex continuity, you're tempted to just sort of get out all of the toys and make a mess. (laughs) Every, you know, subplot every secondary character, every storyline that's ever existed, you want to just kind of play with it all at once. Uh, and the biggest challenge for me was trying to edit it down, was, was trying to give it focus, because yeah. it can be quite overwhelming to say, oh, I want to play with this character, I want to bring you know this old villain back from whatever, yeah. or pick up this storyline that I love from you know when I was younger. And trying to give all of that focus was was quite tough was quite tough yeah. especially since i think if if there is a type of story to be written about wonder woman it has already been written in some form or another she's got super villains you know she has classic sort of action superhero stuff she's got a mythological element uh she has very strong historical connections to world war ii yeah. so it, it is almost about not just balancing characters and storylines but also genres she exists across multiple genres yeah and getting that tone right is is very very challenging yeah so how did you narrow all of that down because like you said there's 75 years of history for wonder woman and she's involved in different genres so how did you go through that process of narrowing the things that you wanted to include down i started out by thinking okay what's what's the most interesting aspect of her background to me and starting there. And for me, it was the, the Themyscirian aspect, the Amazons who sort of exist in this parallel world of pseudo-Greco-Roman mythology. And the, the fact that Wonder Woman grew up essentially in this utopia, this, this, this kind of feminist utopia led by powerful matriarchs who are the ultimate warriors, but also very... Uh, you know, committed to justice and all of this other stuff. Yeah. To go from that to our world has to be pretty shocking. Yeah. <laughs> and traditionally, the the sort of path back to that utopia has been sealed. She's, she's kind of stuck in our world. She can't go back home. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to open up that pathway again, make it so that she can travel back and forth? Because, you know, like Odysseus, to, to pull again on the Greco-Roman element of her story, yeah. sometimes the hardest part of a journey is not, you know, the hard part in the middle where you're fighting the bad guy. It's going back home again and realizing that you've changed. Yeah. So that that was something that I really wanted to get into. Okay. So the story kind of focuses around Wonder Woman being exiled and and uh, exiled from Themyscira and being a refugee on Earth. So obviously these are kind of 
terms and things that we're quite familiar with in the current situation of the world and sometimes it's not always seen to be a good thing to be a refugee so there's a lot of negativity around that and um, so did the current state of the world encourage you to write the story and in include that those terms no i mean she's that's been part of her story really since the beginning and though she is very much in exile i try to use the term exile rather than refugee because i i think being the fact that she's essentially royalty and she has these powers that human beings really almost can't even aspire to, uh, you know, she, she, she sort of passes as a white woman. I felt like it was sort of, it would be a little bit belittling to the, to the struggles of real actual refugees. Be like, yes, this go up, you know, this extremely yeah. powerful, in some ways, very privileged character is going through exactly what you're going through. But by that same token, uh, especially in this first arc, I, I tried to get into and unpack uh, her her kind of relationship to warfare and to conflicts that create refugees. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I think that's something, and she, she says that quite explicitly, that she has an extremely ambivalent relationship to, uh, you know, she has these, these kind of allies and friends uh, in the military, particularly Etta Candy, who in this timeline... Uh, now holds a position of command yeah. and is, you know, kind of very much a steely-eyed, you know, realist warrior herself. But by that same token, you know, I, I wanted Wonder Woman to be a person who was asking questions yeah. uh, and kind of pushing back a little bit against the narrative of warfare and the need for war. Yeah. And so, you know, that's something that we really get into in... Uh, you know, in the first part of the story, where you have, uh, you know, people who have been, or these mythological creatures, rather, who have been, uh, you know, woken up, essentially, in our world, and don't know how to get back to their own, and are caught up in a conflict that they did not create, which I think is something um, that our, our current refugee crisis certainly has parallels with yeah. that sense that you are caught up in a conflict that in many cases has nothing to do with you, that has intruded on your life in ways that you cannot control yeah. and in which you have no say. Um, but, you know, to do that, I wanted to create characters who were much more like ordinary human beings, who, did, who were not descended from royalty, who, uh, you know, who sort of had to face that on their own without superpowers, without the backing of a powerful government and uh, and, and navigate it uh, really in isolation. And, and you know, because I, I think that uh, is something that we should all be grappling with on some way or another. Yeah, definitely. Um, so kind of going back to uh, the myth mythological creatures that are introduced and are trying to get back home. Um, so the story is, well, it kind of starts off quite serious and then you've got these aspects of sort of Myth, mythology and fantasy coming in wh where they're sort of sat in the diner I think that part made me laugh a little bit um so did you want to why did you want to include both of those genres in in this story um I, I think it is important even when you're talking about a fairly serious subject to have just points where ordinary life is, is part of the story uh you know elements that you can laugh at elements of you know sort of very human foibles. Um, I, I think there's a real danger, especially in a story like this, that's about, uh, you know, kind of this very regal magisterial character yeah. to take everything with sort of deadly seriousness uh, and, and not be able to have those more human moments where people are laughing, where there are misunderstandings, yeah. or where there's a little bit of comedy or even absurdity. You know, I, I think having those elements is, is useful because if it's if it's all grim then we lose sight of what the point is yeah, <laughs> you know no, telling exactly. the story in the first place yeah okay so there, there are several moments where wonder woman and diana have doubts and questions herself so why did you think it was important to in, to sort of show that side of her as well as the fearless and confident side uh i, I think it makes her much more relatable when she doesn't always know what the right thing to do is, 
like all the rest of us. Yeah. I think she's got this really tremendous power set. She's got speed. She has strength. She has these mythological weapons. Um, she's really intelligent. She's beautiful. Most of us will never be all those things. Uh, so I think having parts of her that are relatively human, where she doesn't know the way out of the situation that she's in, uh, she doubts herself, she wonders if she's taking the right path, makes it so that the things that she learns are things that we can use in our own lives. Um, and, and so that, that relatability and trying to find the parts of her character that are quite human was important to me because... Otherwise, why tell the story? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if there's nothing that we can relate to in it, then um, then I think that the story is incomplete. There is such a thing as being too perfect. Yeah. Definitely. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that, that Wonder Woman has flaws and misgivings and doubts just the way that we do. Yeah. So going back to uh, the start of the interview where you mentioned that you wanted to bring Wonder Woman to life for people that are diehard fans, but also new ones... How did you incorporate Wonder Woman for those new fans? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You know, I don't know if I've succeeded or not. It's one of those things uh, that's, that's really hard to gauge. You don't ever want to have so much uh, continuity and, and explaining and backstory and exposition that it just weighs the whole story down. Yeah. Um, but by that same token you also don't want to just kind of neglect all of this world building that other people have done for 75 years and, and just kind of ignore it. So yeah. striking that balance between making it not so quantum entangled that new readers can't even understand what's going on, but by the same to- that same token, making it rewarding for long-time fans who do know some of her backstory uh, was, was quite a difficult thing to, to pull off and one of the reasons that I introduced several new characters at the very beginning yeah. to give new readers an entry point. You don't have to know these people's backstory because they have no backstory. They're totally new. They're discovering this world for the first time. Yeah. Just like you. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, the, the character also has this amazing rogues gallery of villains, uh, you know, who's sort of been with her for, for decades in some cases. And, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that, that they were incorporated as well and that these, these sort of long, simmering conflicts were part of the story. So I don't know. I don't know if I succeeded or not. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was really a juggling act to try to get that right, to, to try to get, to try to balance those, those new reader-friendly elements with the, uh, the sort of the ongoing continuity of the character. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I tend to read Superman comics but I am a fan of Wonder Woman and know a little bit about her background and um, mythology um, so this is actually probably the first Wonder Woman based comic that I've read so you've definitely got me into oh, the, wow. the, the, to the Wonder Woman comic so well, yeah thank you. <laughs> that's very wonderful to hear <laughs> no, you've well, definitely that's, been that's successful one, one, one person. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm sure there's plenty more that's great to hear <laughs> but I'm um, so with the villains, how did you pick the ones that you wanted to include in the story? Are, are they were you sort of fans of them uh, growing up or things like that, or is it just something that you were introduced to? Um, you, you know, for me, it was again trying to sort of pull on story threads that new readers might be familiar with, even people who've just seen the movie and know nothing else about the character. So Ares was a pretty obvious one, but also get in some of the really wonderful, more pulpy, classically superhero-y um, supervillains like Veronica Kale yeah. and Cheetah and uh, I'm trying to think of, wait, are these in the first arc or are these in the second arc? <laughs> like, who do we meet in the first five issues? Uh, and Giganta, who is just a great character. So I thought it was really choosing supervillains who appealed to me who had history with the character and who I thought I could possibly say something halfway new or interesting about. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of stuck with those. And uh, yeah, I think what's interesting about Wonder Woman as well is that there's so many great female supervillains in her story. Yeah. She's got, again, Veronica Kill and Cheetah, Giganta, uh, Grail is sort of a newer one. So it's, it's interesting to me when both the 
central protagonist and the central villain are women, I, I think that that puts an interesting spin on a lot of classic superhero material. Yeah, um, like, well, like I said, it's not something that always happens, so it is nice to see that. Um, so sadly, you've left Wonder Woman to work on a project that's kind of in mystery at the moment. Is there anything you can tell us about that, or is it still secret? Yes. No, I it was um, I was happily able to announce it a couple of weeks ago at New York Comic Con oh, okay. in spring of next year. I am going to be writing The Dreaming, which is the big ongoing story in the Sandman universe, which is a playground that I've always, always, always wanted to play <laughs> in as a sort of a former goth. And so I'm extremely excited to be taking on the dreaming in in the spring of 2020 mm -hmm. uh but sad to be leaving wonder woman at the same time yeah even though i'm really really excited to see what steve orlando has in store for her so it's it's always fun to go from being a writer to being a fan yeah so would you ever return to the, to wonder woman as a character or dc comics in general yes yeah absolutely i would uh i, I think with a character like this there are so many possible story threads to follow that there will never be a lack of material. And in fact, a couple of days ago, I was just sort of sitting here and, and this light bulb went off. I was like, oh man, <laughs> now that I've the series, I have this really great idea for another <laughs> Wonder Woman story. So I'm sure it's something that I'll, I'll be thinking about for a long time. Yeah. And are there any other DC characters that you'd like to work on? Oh gosh, lots. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think I've always loved Superman. I grew up with Christopher Reeve as sort of one of my first crushes. I think he's a fascinating <laughs> character. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot. I love what's being done now with um, some of the classic supervillains like Harley Quinn. I love this kind of renaissance that they're having. Um and Poison Ivy, yeah. uh, you know, like a lot of, there's, there's just a lot of, I think, stories that take a second look at characters that we thought we knew mm -hmm. and show us that maybe we don't know them as well as we thought. Yeah. And that's something that I, I really, really love about what DC is doing right now in general. Yeah. Well, I won't take too much more of your time, but thank you for taking the time to speak with me. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much.